On November the 13th, 1974, at around 3.15am, 23-year-old Ronald DeFeo Jr. stalked the dark hallways of his family home with a high-powered, fully-loaded rifle at his side as his family lay fast asleep in their beds. He entered his mother and father's bedroom, aimed his weapon and brutally shot them as they slept. He then systematically entered each and every bedroom of his four siblings, aimed his weapon and pulled the trigger killing everyone instantly. The dead included Ronald's parents, Louise and Ronald DeFoe Sr., his 18-year-old sister Dawn, his 13-year-old sister Alison, his 12-year-old brother Mark, and his 9-year-old brother, John Matthew. All six family members were found in their beds positioned on their stomachs, shot in the back. After the shooting, Ronald showered and disposed of his bloodstained clothing. He then went about his day as normal, by going to work and trying his best to build himself an alibi, telling anyone who would listen that he had been trying to reach his parents all day by phone, but wasn't having any luck. He left work at around 12 midday and met with his friends at the local bar. Eventually, Ronald left the bar, only to return around 6.30pm, bursting into the bar claiming he had found his mother and father dead and he thought that they had been shot. A small group from the bar went to the Defoe home and discovered both parents were indeed dead. The police were called and the rest of the family members were found. Ronald tried to blame the murders on a local hitman who was connected to the mob, but his story was full of inconsistencies and he was quickly exposed as a liar he was. The very next day, Ronald would finally confess to the murders that he had committed at 1112 Ocean Avenue, Amityville, New York. Ronald told the police that on the night of the shooting, he had been taking drugs whilst watching a movie in the family home. He then heard his family conspiring to kill him from the other room. Then, without warning, a hooded black-handed demon approached him, holding the rifle out to him, and told him to kill his family. Ronald said in a later interview, once he started shooting, he couldn't stop. He felt his actions were not being controlled by himself. Many believe that Ronald was after the insanity verdict. However, the involvement of suggested demonic possession on top of the horrific bloody murders that had already taken place only fueled the many paranormal stories that would emerge. The strange thing was, there was no evidence that any of the family members awoke as Ronald went from room to room shooting the very loud rifle into the dead of night. The rifle Ronald used would have made a tremendous noise, which should have been enough to awaken anyone. Amazingly, None of the neighbours heard anything, apart from the DeFeo family dog barking at around 3.15am, the same time that the murders took place. But bizarrely enough, not one gunshot was reported. Ronald DeFeo Jr. was found guilty on six counts of second degree murder and was sentenced to six consecutive life sentences. Just over a year later, the Amityville house would open its doors to a new family. Just over a year after the murders, the house at 1112 Ocean Avenue was purchased at a bargain price due to the tragedies that had occurred. The house was sold to George and Kathy Lutz, who knew all about the killings but decided that they were not superstitious and did not have a problem living in the house, especially at the bargain price that it was offered. The Amateurville house has six bedrooms, a heated pool, a garage and a bolt house at the back, a perfect home to build a life and a happy memories. On December the 18th, the family move into the home. The new residents of the house were George and Kathy, Kathy's three children from a previous marriage, nine-year-old Daniel, seven-year-old Christopher, and five-year-old Melissa, who had been given the nickname Missy, along with their family dog, Harry. As we said before, Kathy and George were not superstitious, but a close friend had recommended that they get the house blessed. So George and Kathy decided to heed their friend's advice and call in a Catholic priest. On the day the priest visited, he was left to his own devices to roam the house and bless each room as he saw fit. However, something did happen to the priest that we will come back to later. Before leaving, he approached George and Kathy, looking shaken and troubled. Before he left, 
he advised the couple to not spend too much time in a room on the second floor where Kathy would eventually set up a sewing room and then the priest turned and left the house immediately. George and Kathy started to notice strange happenings almost instantly after moving in. The house would make strange sounds in the dead of night. Not unusual for such a big house, but as Christmas come to an end, the sounds changed into something more menacing. Also on top of this, each member of the family became distant and experienced things that were unique to only them. George in particular started to act strange. He claimed he was always cold and no matter what he did could not warm up. He became obsessed with chopping wood and burning fires as he tried in vain to keep himself warm. The atmosphere between the family changed. Things became tense and arguments were now a common occurrence and communication began to break down and the unusual occurrences intensified over the coming days. Some of the occurrences including a slime substance appearing all over the bathroom taps and walls and there was also a large infestation of flies despite the cold weather. Every night at 3.15am George would snap awake. Funnily enough this was the same time that the murders took place. Also Kathy was plagued by nightmares which reoccurred every night. She claimed that in her dream she would follow Ronald DeFeo around the house and witness him shooting his entire family as he did on that fateful night. Kathy claimed she knew the order of the killings and the area of the bodies that the bullets entered. This knowledge that Kathy supposedly had was later confirmed by Ronald DeFeo's attorney who had access to the case files. George started to roam the hallways of the house at night and he began to notice that everyone in the house started to sleep on their stomachs just like the DeFeos did on the night they were shot. There were certain areas in the house that smelled of overpowering perfume and excrement and more slime started to appear on the walls and dripping through keyholes. Over the coming days the Lutzes also began to worry about their five year old daughter Melissa who now spent most of her time in her bedroom talking to an invisible presence. Now it's not that unusual for a little girl to create an imaginary friend but her description of her imaginary friend who she called Jodie was very disconcerting. Missy described Jodie as being a pig who could be as big or as small as it wanted and could be visible or invisible. George became more concerned one day when he sat down with his little girl and asked her what kind of conversations was she having with Jodie and what he heard next troubled him. Apparently Jodie had told Melissa that she would always live in the house and never leave and George came to the conclusion that a five year old little girl could not have made something like this up and it was a few nights later that George's fears were confirmed to him. One night as George was returning from the bolt house he happened to peek up at Melissa's window and noticed a pig like creature staring down at him with eyes that burned red. George rushed into the house and bolted up the stairs as fast as he could only to find that the room was in fact empty. There were other times that George had witnessed Melissa talking to Jodie who was apparently sat in Melissa's rocking chair which was rocking freely of its own accord. On more than one occasion George and Kathy had also caught the pig like creature staring at them from outside the house peering in at them. When George went out to investigate of course he found nothing apart from cloven hoof prints in the snow. George was also awoken at night by the sound of the front door slamming open and shut whilst he lay in bed. The noise was enough to wake the whole family but no one did and when he went down he found that the door was shut and locked and the dog sound asleep on the floor. On other nights he claimed to be jolted awake by the sound of a loud brass band playing off tune from downstairs and like before no one else could hear this but George and as soon as he investigated, the noise of the marching band would simply cease. Kathy started to get in the habit of hanging crucifixes around the house that would turn of their own accord and give off a sour odour. Another strange occurrence came when George tripped over a line ornament that they had in the living room, hurting his ankle, and on closer inspection, he found what looked like bite marks. George decided to move the line ornament out of the room, but somehow it always seemed to find its way back and no matter how many times George removed the ornament, he claimed that it always reappeared. Other wild terrifying claims were also made, like the windows opening and shutting of their own accord, or even exploding inwards into the house shattering all over the carpet. 
and George also recalls a time when Kathy's face seemed to turn into an old hag's right before his eyes, and seemed to take hours to return to normal. At their wit's end, and desperate for some peace, George and Kathy decided to carry out a blessing of their own, and on January the 8th, 1976, George held a silver crucifix as they both recited the Lord's Prayer as they went from room to room. George claims that as he entered the living room, he could hear a chorus of ghostly voices begging them to stop. George and Kathy claim that after the blessing, this just seemed to anger the entity or entities that resided in the house. Kathy also claims that every time she tried to contact the priest by phone, there was always static down the line, preventing them from hearing each other. After a final failed blessing, the Lutz family experienced a night of inconceivable disturbing events that terrified them so much that they have never spoken fully about what actually happened on that final horrific night. On January the 14th, 1976, in the middle of the night, the Lutz family fled the family home after just 28 days. They never returned to the house again, and left all of the belongings behind. The newspapers were quick to write about the amazing events that had happened at the Amityville house, which also caught the attention of many paranormal investigators worldwide, including Ed and Lorraine Warren. The house was visited by Ed and Lorraine, and a team of paranormal investigators, photographers and journalists. Lorraine claimed that there was a deep, dark evil in the house, and the family were right to flee. A professional photographer who was part of the team of the paranormal investigators set up a camera on the second floor landing that would automatically take pictures in infrared. The camera caught the image of a young boy with white eyes peeking out of a doorway on the second floor hall. The picture is considered to be one of the best paranormal photographs ever taken and is as clear as day. Some have speculated that it could be the ghost of the murdered child John DeFeo who was shot dead in his bed. It is said that no children were in the house at the time of the photograph, giving more credence to the case. After lots and lots of publicity, a book and a Hollywood movie, the Lutz family became very well known, appearing on various TV shows telling their story. After the release of the Amityville horror movie, the priest that blessed the second floor room that became Kathy's sewing room came forward and told his story. The priest claimed that he entered the sewing room and he started to splash holy water when he noticed the temperature drop drastically and a deep disturbing voice that seemed to be coming from straight behind him demanded that he get out. This was followed by a hard slap to the face from an invisible hand. And it was at this point when he left the house but not before warning George about the room but didn't divulge what had actually happened to him. The priest also claimed to have discovered blisters appearing on his palms resembling the stigmata. The priest tried to reach George and Kathy by phone many times to inform them of what actually happened, but as Kathy said, the phone line was full of static that prevented the priest's story from being told. Throughout the years to the present day, no one has ever experienced any paranormal experiences in the Amityville house, and no one has ever found any evidence that the events ever took place. Many claim that the Lutz's story of the haunting was all fabricated lies, part of a get-rich-quick scheme that allowed them a book deal and a movie out of an amazing story that they made up. But many make the argument as to why would the Lutz family just up and leave their property and all of the possessions and risk everything that they owned. George and Kathy later divorced and went their separate ways, but even on their deathbeds, both claim that the horrific events did actually take place at 112 Ocean Avenue, Amityville, New York. But like I always say, I'll let you decide. I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening.